Star Wars 7x7 episode 2852. Star Wars Celebration Anaheim is just about a month away. I'm getting pretty excited for it. I hope you're getting excited for it too. And I thought it would be fun to revisit some conversations that we've had here on the show about Celebration and in particular hosting Star Wars Celebration, what goes into it and all that good stuff. So today we're going to start a series of looks back at conversations we've had on the show with hosts of Celebration Stages. Punch it! Hey Rebel Razor, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy and thank you so much for joining me for it. So today we're going to start off with a conversation I had in 2016 with Amy Ratcliffe who was hosting a Star Wars celebration stage for the first time at that event. This is Celebration Europe, it took place in London in July of 2016. So we got to talk about her work in the behind the scenes stage and all the stuff that that entails. This is the first of a two part conversation and so we'll have part one here today. So without further ado, here's part one of my conversation with Amy Ratcliffe talking about Celebration Europe. Amy Ratcliffe, thank you so much for joining us on Star Wars 7x7. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to talk to you again. Oh yeah, it's been a while since Celebration Anaheim, actually, I guess, since we've chatted in real time at least. Oh yeah, it has been that long. Yeah. Sorry, that's... My coffee maker beeping in the background. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I did hear it, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, for everybody listening, um, I'm actually in Galway, Ireland right now at 6 p.m. locally here, and I'm catching Amy on the West Coast where it's, uh, what, 10 a.m. over there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> we're on opposite sides of the day. I'm ready for a beer, actually. I I wouldn't turn down a beer, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Well, that's it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> See, that's what's awesome about being able to control the conditions of your work as as you and I both do. Um, I mean, you are a freelance writer, a full time freelance writer. You are literally living the dream life. You are a writer supporting yourself by your writing. Yeah, and it's pretty wild. Sometimes I, I don't know, like sometimes it, your job, even when it's your passion, is your job, and you have bad days, but. When those days come up, I try to remind myself that essentially I make a good portion of my living writing about Star Wars, and that's not so bad. No. <laughs> really, in the scheme of things, I'm pretty, I don't want to say lucky, that's not the right word, because I work really hard, but things have lined up, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm constantly grateful for it. Blessed for sure, at least. Yes, that's mm-hmm. a better, yeah, that's a good word for it. Yeah, definitely. And is Star Wars the only fandom you write about? No, I write about um, a variety of other things. I write a lot about television in general. That's kind of my other kind of, I don't want to, hmm. yeah, that's a, that's a, the other part of what I usually spend my days on. It's between Star Wars and television. And I write a lot about DC Comics television. When those sh- uh, when all their shows are airing, I do columns for dccomics.com about the Easter eggs in each, like in Flash or Legends. Mm -hmm. You know, if they mention a street name, that's a creator, or they bring in a character from the comics, like those kind of things. So once he, like right now is kind of nice, because I can fill my schedule and like I don't have to, like I enjoy watching television, but when you have to watch it, it just becomes a little more of a, not a chore, but I'm, so I'm enjoying my summer vacation right now to catch up on <laughs> right. what I call like my vacation TV that I don't have to write about, like Jane the Virgin mm-hmm. or The Hundred. Um, but yeah, I spend spend a lot of time writing about comic book television. Well, this is a banner time for you to be doing it then, because they've got three different shows on the CW, and then Supergirl's coming over to the CW in the fall too, I believe. It is, and it's wild. I think actually Monday through Thursday, maybe. Maybe even Monday through Friday. No, it's Monday through Thursday. No, Friday, because iZombie. Um, anyway, every night on the CW is anchored with a comic book television series. Wow. wow. Which is, and that's just the CW, not counting S.H.I.E.L.D. and the stuff on Netflix or Powerless. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, that's the PlayStation uh, one, right? Oh, um, no, Powerless no, that's, is that's, a, dif- yeah, that's a different one. Yeah, but then Powers and also, like, Walking Dead and Preacher, like... Mm-hmm. Outcast. It's kind of bizarre sometimes when I think about. I used to be able to make a list or maybe count on one hand the shows on television that were influenced by comic books, but now I can't even keep them straight without, you know, referencing the <laughs> internet. 
So are you able to, uh, you mentioned looking for um, street names that might be Easter eggs because they're part of the creators, you know, one of the creators is named after the street or the street's named after the creator or somebody that works on the show. Are you in contact with the the showrunners or somebody with, with the shows that are like feeding you these Easter eggs to write about? Or is this just your inherent knowledge and research that is able to help bring those about or bring those to it- the fore? It's all research. I have access to screeners, so I get to watch the episodes early. So it's not, you know, watching them while they air. And mm-hmm. it's just paying really close attention. And I I admit that I don't have an encyclopedia. Well, I, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of much because my memory is terrible. So even though I know Star Wars really well, I, that's like, don't hold on to trivia. <laughs> that's what Wikipedia is for. Exactly. I mean, that's what I think the lines in the last Indiana Jones movie were – his dad is just like, well, that's why I wrote it down, so I didn't have to remember. And that's kind of how <laughs> right. I feel mm-hmm. about a lot of things. So it's a lot of, like, I hear a name, and if I don't immediately recognize it, I make notes. Mm-hmm. Like, just kind of anything that could be an Easter egg. And then I go dig around and research after I'm done watching. Or if I can't quite figure it out, like, I have a couple contacts. Um, my editor that I work with at DC Comics, you know, and he'll ask. and He can go ask the TV people, and sometimes they'll tell us, and sometimes they won't. Um, so it's it's kind of a fun... It's kind of a fun game, actually. To, it's like because I feel like it's a challenge to like just find them all. Right. So I enjoy. I really enjoy doing those. Now, how long have you been writing about Star Wars specifically, or any Star Wars related topics? Let's see. I started my own blog, Geek with Curves, in like around uh, two thousand nine ish, I think. Oh wow! And I wrote some Star Wars stuff in there, but I remember my first writing gig that was not on my website that that didn't pay and should have but I was I was young and I didn't know better was writing about Clone Wars for Newsarama I wrote uh, recaps and I forget I think that was around season season three maybe so maybe 2010 ish or so yeah in there. some somewhere in that neighborhood so that's when I started writing about it for you know other other sites right and then um, a couple of years later, you decide to just jump in and, and go full bore freelance and no other safety net. Yeah, exactly. When I started writing uh, my blog, I started picking up, like I said, slowly other gigs. And I worked, you know, it was a lot of work. I would work my, my day job at the time. It was very intense. I worked in a pet, with a pet food manufacturer and did quality control and logistics. And that was easily a 60, 70 hour a week job. And then yeah. I would come home every evening and write and I got pretty burnt out and pretty tired but eventually I was able to build up enough writing gigs to support myself and then leave the day job behind that is fantastic and when did you start with Full of Sith? that's a great question that I do not remember the answer to <laughs> um, I know I was going to start when they, when they first started the podcast they asked me about it and I'm like every week is that's a commitment to mm-hmm. do a podcast every week for me, I, so many of so many of you do it, uh, and I can't. I don't like. I don't know weekly things on my schedule. Like they have to be at a certain time. Like stress me out. <laughs> so I said no at first, and then eventually they had Consetta as a, a, a wonderful co-host, Consetta Parker. Right, she's amazing. Um, but she couldn't. Like she had to leave the show because her schedule got busier. And I and I stepped in, and they're flexible with me in that. I don't have to be there every week. I try to be there every week, but I don't also, because we record on the weekends, but I also, like, I don't schedule my weekends around recording full stuff. Like, if something comes up, something comes up, and they're nice about it for now. (laughs) (laughs) And now you're actually doing two, because now you're doing lattes with Leia, I believe, as well, right? Exactly. What sold me on that is, you know, Dan at Coffee with Kenobi approached me about possibly doing one, and I'm like, well, it's just once a month. And it's with my dear friend, Dre Letamendi, who is local to Los Angeles. And it, we record, it's one of the rare instances we, like in a podcast where I get to sit across from her and we record together. So besides recording an episode of a podcast about Star Wars, which we talk about anyway, it's like I get a, it's a set date that I will see my friend every month that we, you know, we figure out at the beginning of the month our schedules. Mm-hmm. So, and I just, I... I love Full of Sith, but Lattes with Leia is I'm sitting there with one of my best friends talking about Star Wars, and I look forward to it every single month. We have a really good time. Plus, Dre is so smart. Like, she always she always gives me new things to think about. 
She's a degreed, like, I think if I rem remember right reading the description, she's a degreed person. I'm sorry to say I have not listened to it yet, emphasis on the yet, but I do. <laughs> it's on my phone ready to listen to. Um, oh, yeah. She, yeah, she's a clinical psychologist. That's it. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was psychologist or psychiatrist. Okay. Got it. And so, um, yeah, there was a, a Star Wars psychology book that came out earlier this year, too. I don't suppose she was part of that by chance. Uh, she was not. Ah, actually. that's too bad. Yeah, it is too bad because she she's she knows her stuff, <laughs> and been a fan for quite a while as well as you know, as you have, I would imagine. Yes, definitely. Maybe even longer, actually. So you've been uh, freelance writing for about two years or so, and then you also write, of course, for StarWars.com and Star Wars Insider magazine. And now you actually are making a huge leap from behind the computer to full on the stage with Star Wars Celebration, which is super exciting. It is exciting. It's a little nerve wracking because for the longest time, and it's weird, like in this day and age, like I can absolutely continue to be a writer, but video content is becoming more and more important for outlets like Nerdist. Not that they're asking freelancers to contribute, but it's just a good skill like being comfortable on video and be comfortable hosting is a good skill to have in your wheelhouse. And it's not something I've been terribly comfortable with. I'm pretty shy. I don't like to be on camera. I'm very self-conscious, but I started like I started easing into it. You know, when I started working with IGN at Comic-Con probably 3 or 4 years ago now, you know, you do press lines for them and those are on camera, but it's just your hand holding the microphone it's not your face so i totally like started doing more and more stuff in front of the camera mm -hmm. and then i got to host the star wars rebels season two finale q a when was that the end of march i guess or the beginning of april and it was on the disney lot and i hosted a q a after the episodes aired with dave floney and simon kenberg it which is it, it's a little intimidating was that the first and, time you'd met either of them uh no, which is good. I I'd, I'd interviewed them both before. I thought so. But just, okay. Yeah, but just in that setting, after mm -hmm. coming off those really emotional episodes, and then Ashley Eckstein and Taylor Gray came up too. So I I don't know of this for sure, but I feel like in some ways that was like an audition for Celebration hosting, even though I didn't know it. Yeah, that's what I was ex just gonna ask you. So I assume that that happened then before they asked you for Celebration. Yeah, so before that had happened, my contact at Lucasfilm had mentioned, she's like, I want to ask you something about Celebration. And at that she mentioned that at the same time she brought up hosting, but she's like, I want you to get through this Q&A first. So I don't, I don't know that it was an audition, but I feel like if I, if I would have bombed the q and A, I I might not, I might not have got another phone call about <laughs> Celebration. But you did get the phone call. Would you mind, you know, telling us about that? Like, how did, how did this come up? Well, you know, my PR contact at Lucasfilm I've worked with since the Clone Wars, uh, Tracy Canobio, and we've had a good relationship. And, you know, in some ways, I, I, it's weird now to look back, like if I run into, like, Dee Bradley Baker or Ashley Eckstein, anybody that was on the Clone Wars, I've run into them at Rebels events. It's like seeing, like, old friends because right. I've just worked with them so, like, done so many interviews and events and things over the years. So they just bottom me and I don't know you know I'm the first that's long overdue there have been several celebrations and no no female stage shows and it was something I noticed people commented on at the last celebration on you know on social media and rightly so mm -hmm. and actually that celebration it was all all the hosts were white males and they're all oh, David Collins I hugely respect James Ronald Taylor is obviously great but changing it up is good so I don't know if they intentionally, I think they did put some thought and realize like, oh, we need a female stage host. And I'm just glad my name was, was on the list. And once Tracy knew I was interested, because it is a lot of work, like I'm not going to see much of the convention because I'm going to be on my stage every day for most of the day. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there are rehearsals like the day before, rehearsals early in the morning before the show starts. So with, and then all the prep work, right, for interviewing. Some panelists will have their own presentations that they just want to run, and I'm hands off. Mm -hmm. But others, it's, you know, I'm essentially mod, like moderating the panel, so it's a lot of prep work. So, so it's, oh, go ahead, sorry. I was just going to say, so there's probably almost a divide within you where, you know, the fan and, and podcasting side of you is almost thinking, oh, gosh, maybe I, sh I don't want to do this because of all the things I'm going to miss out on that I would have experienced otherwise, but... But of course, you're going to say yes to something like that, of course. 
Exactly. That's exactly what I went through in my head. I'm like, man, because even if I was going to this convention as press, I still see a lot of panels. Like, I see the things I want to see. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't say no to this opportunity. Yeah, and for it to be the the first woman to do it, it, it seems shocking somehow that that's really the case. But it's, it you know, it's just one of those strange things that gosh why did this take so long and you know, how head smackingly obvious it should have been and maybe it's just um i mean maybe it's a sign of the times or maybe it's lucasfilm you know finally realizing hey you know what we actually have you know strong women that we're featuring in our movies and in the stories that we're telling now maybe we you know need to clean up of these other areas where we don't have um, you know, strong women representing the franchise and representing the best of Lucasfilm in, in these other areas, like with Celebration. And I think that's very possible. I think we've definitely made a lot of progress, like you said, on film and in the television series. It's been a slow burn, but I think Lucasfilm is really... I think they're making forward steps. And yeah. I think this is a match to that. Absolutely. It does seem... It does seem interesting how, I mean, even, you know, when you look at just voting rights in the United States, you know, first it was white men, then it was black men, then it was women finally getting the right. So it almost seems like there's a, you know, a historical process repeating in a way. Yeah, you're right. It kind of goes in ripples. Mm -hmm. And finally, once it happens, you're like, how did that, how did that take so long? Right. Why <laughs> wasn't this obvious to everybody that we, so... I think we'll get there. We're getting closer to it with fandom, but there's still room mm -hmm. room to move forward. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's boggling that women have not been able to vote in the U.S. for 100 years yet. That's, that still just blows my mind. I, wow. 1920. I didn't realize that's what those numbers were. That's, that's bananas. I know. 1920, yeah. It's only been 96 years. I mean, how is that possible? Yeah. It took us a while there, didn't it? Yes, yeah. it did. Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, it's, I guess it's nice to be living in a more enlightened time. <laughs> that is so true for many reasons. Oh, yeah. Including flush toilets. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Which I've been wondering about, funnily enough, like, I, I don't know whether bidets are common in Ireland or anything like that, but I've been, I've been looking forward to finding my first bidet. I figure it's more of a European thing than a U.S. thing, but I haven't come across one yet. Yeah, I'm surprised. Is it more of an Australian thing than a European thing? I don't know. I guess I always I thought it was a French thing. I thought maybe maybe it was a continental thing, perhaps. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. It well, keep be. me posted. <laughs> if I come across one, I'll let you know. Well, you've been to <laughs> London before. You were telling me before we started recording. So, um, which of course is where celebration is happening this year. But I take it no bidets in London. Uh, not that I encountered. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to stop it right there and tune in tomorrow for the rest of our interview with Amy Ratcliffe. And there you go. We're going to stop it right there and we'll pick up the second half of the conversation tomorrow. So it just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for this episode. As always, and may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited by their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.